I came here with the name Betty LaDuke. I ended up with the name Betty LaDuke Westergaard. I came in 1964 because I had a job, my first college teaching job, in the art department of Southern Oregon College. The campus was very small, and I had an office that had been an enlarged, that was an, an old broom closet in the basement of, I think it was a Brit at that point. It was pretty dim, pretty dull, and or, so it was not that building, it was another one. And um, I had five classes to teach, not much different from the junior high where I was teaching in East Los Angeles after I got my degree at Los Angeles State College, which is now a university. So it wasn't a pay change, and it wasn't much in terms of the work, the hours of work, but it was just a challenge and I wanted it and I wanted college teaching. So I came eagerly and uh, have la and lasted 32 years. Who was in your department at the time? Well, I think it was Jim Durder that was the head of the department and um, uh, there were about five people, Bob Alston, um, I'm forgetting some of the, Bedonia, Frank Bedonia, and there were about two other people, so there were, they were all men. And I came to take Marion Eady's place and she was the woman who had been here many, many decades before myself. And I actually got to meet her, she was still around, retired at last, but it was sad to see a woman that had dreams of being creative, so used by the system, so, so exploited by the system, um, that th there was no time for her to paint. She passed away soon after. But she had a wonderful giving attitude and students and, and everyone loved her. She was a great person. But it made me say to myself, this is not going to happen to me. So what did you do so it didn't happen to you? I kept working. I kept working, and um, and also things got better. From, so from five classes, um, it was four classes, then and then finally three. But also, I had a wonderful marriage a year later, and a very supportive husband. And I had a studio, so I have a small kitchen and a studio on the other side of the kitchen that's very big. And that was a bargain in our marriage. We were both professional people, and this is what I needed, and that was our agreement when we built this house with very, very little money. The house has since grown through five decades. But it was that arrangement and support. So I feel very, very lucky in, in that sense. Also, um, when you live in a big area like Los Angeles, it takes a lot of time to travel to and fro. I could walk to the college and walk back, and I could paint between classes, even lunchtime. So I, I never waited for a long, whole day to paint. Every day something had to happen, and it could be squeezing in the hours here or there, early in the morning, late afternoon, you know, whatever, whatever, because also there was a child and then a second child. So that was part of who I am. What was the campus like at that time? You <clears throat> talked yesterday about women. What I liked about the campus is it was small and it was one coffee pot and you met people in that room, uh, I think it was in in Brit, where the coffee pot was. So you met people from other departments and you learned to chat and learn to say your name and to you know catch on. So who's in science, who's in biology, who's here, who's there. So you make some friends that way, which was good. And in those days, um, nobody had a lot of money. Like early friends were like the Rybergs, for example, uh, Chela, Chela Tapp. Um, other folks and th whose names are not you know right on top right now but it didn't take much like our couch was like cement blocks and a plywood board and a foam cushion and what you did was you had a big jug of wine you made a cake and you said hey let's get together on Sunday afternoons and you just weren't shy but um, so I came up alone with Winona but even then on Morton Street the house is still there a tiny duplex I had an etching press so the etching press 
and the couch competed for room. But it didn't matter. People enjoyed each other because everyone was young. Everyone was economically you know, not, not well settled yet. And that's how you made friends. You just sort of did it. And in, in turn, you got invited back. So there was a certain camaraderie that was built up. Uh, the Reynolds were another couple. Um, and I'm forgetting names a little bit now. But um, there was there was an, a camaraderie because it wasn't such a big campus where you encountered people in other departments and so on. Were, were you um, funded? Did you have, what was your studio like there? Were you, do you feel like you were able to express yourself there? What were the students like? Or was, I understand this is your heart here. Right. No, what happened with my teaching is I like to work with people and I love the challenge of taking students, especially those whether none or an art major or those who are preparing to teach others or those who are art majors. And I have a way of working where the work becomes personal. It isn't a technical thing. Um, it isn't all about perspective, but it's also about the passion of learning your tools, but quickly, quickly um, using it as a vehicle to, to, to to find your own depth as an individual and your relationship with a larger context, community and society. So I had projects even in the drawing class, like my husband would provide me with pears because he was an agricultural scientist and, and pears were his specialty. But the pears became personalized, human, so that students would touch the pears. And then we would have assignments like, do pear prison. What is it like if that pear becomes a prison to you? What is it like if it becomes pear jazz? What is it like if it becomes um, um, someone that's running or someone that's, that's very frightened? So things took on personalities, and that's how the work became very alive. And I still have bits and pieces of student work in photograph form that I really, really loved and loved to see them being surprised by what they could do. So teaching has been a natural for me. I don't know how to say it other than um, when left alone, I feel like I could dig into the media, I could dig into the basics so that students could learn very quickly not to be afraid because I encouraged messes. I liked working so that uh, nothing, nothing mattered other than the experience of doing it and, and then to, to get your own, to find your own strengths. But uh, things begin with the mess. I say that's how babies are born, so don't be afraid. You know, so it's kind of you know, so they had to get used to me, and um, and I've always you know, so that's been it. And then later on, I had academic challenges when I taught the woman in art and then art in the third world. So those were more um, a different kind of challenge. In those days, nobody wanted you to teach like anybody else. You could have the freedom to. Um, to, to set up the projects and to cover the media that was asked of you and to cover some of the basic ideas. But it wasn't like one book, one curriculum is like a plan for all of us to teach exactly alike. We had room to be who we were as teachers and that was a blessing. Did you have any difficulty getting those courses through? Or I didn't, which was great. That happened later on. Um, it happened later on and um, uh, and all by chance as I began to, the travels and began to realize the travels which became annual summer travels of anywhere from three weeks to six weeks but mostly like three to four weeks. Um, I began to be interested not only in the culture I was experiencing but also in women. women what are these women creating and what's their life like compared to me, compared to myself? What are their opportunities? So I began to turn things around. But the first place I really began to do it was in Latin America, where I had, you know, where I could speak Spanish, not perfectly, but no one cared about that. But also I would take things um, about my own artwork. I always had something, something to show. And I always, and being a teacher was respectful. And also, um, uh, as I began to write about you know folks um, the women and their stories um, sometimes they were published and I, w I would just let them know that I that why I was doing it and to share with my college students 
And also, in between that, I was bringing my sketchbook and I was able to sketch their environment, their lives, their culture, and that became the subject for my paintings, so it's, and then for my teachings. So it was like a beautiful, beautiful kind of round robin. I was very lucky. Continuity. Yeah, nice and relation. Continuity and integrity of a body of work. Right, and that connect with other women around the world to see their and what their stories were. So my very first book was uh, Compañeras, Women, Art, and Social Change in Latin America, and my good friend Shayla Tapp helped me write. In the sense, like it was not natural for me. I, you know, I was an art major and I did my thesis, but you know, basically I was an artist. And so, um, but the stories were little chapters about the different experience in a certain country, and it was the politics of the art that the women were doing the circumstances that drove them to do embroideries of life and death in Chile, for example, or the birthing dolls in Peru, or uh, the experiences I had in uh, Cuba, um, and what the women artists were sharing there. So it became something that, that was an overflowing, and eventually it got so that I could you know, deal, with, you know, have more confidence in the writing. And City Lights was doing books about the poetry of Latin America. So this was something they jumped on, and I had a lot of help from that editor, and so on. But, uh, You've got books here. Do you want to talk about what Yeah, these are? books are not the ones I've written, but I've been so happy. Uh, like, for example, um, um, uh, I love the title of this, and I love this particular painting, This River of Courage. And this is a painting that was inspired by my trip to Jamaica. And, uh, and it's a woman, but the woman is, is much grander in spirit. She could be woman anywhere in the world. And what it was, was going to Jamaica, and because I read in a magazine a short article about a woman called Edna Manley. Now, she happened to be the wife of the of the premier, the, uh, the first uh, Jamaican premier, and uh, um, and um, she was of English heritage, but she was an artist. And the little story that I read in a dentist magazine uh, got me to understand she was doing some dynamic sculpture. So I, you know, how do I get to meet this woman? So I took first of all a little portfolio of my etchings, so she could see my own work, and um, let her know. And, but somehow it took a week to get an appointment to see her, but I had to go through other people, and people led me to other people. But meanwhile, I was seeing her work in the museum there, and when I met her, I was just blown away by this gracious older person who is, uh, I think, younger than I am now. But um, uh, I think one of her sculptures in the museum was about the grandmother, the grandmother who embraces all the children because the mother is, has to work, and the father is working elsewhere, and the grandmother mother is the one that, that's holding it together. So somehow it's, it's that sense of woman, of woman um, supporting and caring and struggling. So this is a painting uh, that has been used a number of times in a number of different ways, but now I gave it to La Clinica right here in the valley. And uh, I'm just I'm delighted that um, it has a home in a public space that's appropriate for it. Let's see. Uh, oh, here is the a woman in the time of AIDS. It's the same cover again, the same image. She gets used again and again. Mostly I'm so excited that my work just connected with a lot of people of a lot of different cultures, um, from poetry to life stories of Asian pioneers in women's studies. So this was a time when women's studies was just growing and women in art was just growing. Um, and this is one by an African-American woman author, J. California Cooper, The Matter is Life, and just so pleased that she chose my artwork for the cover of her book. And then this is a painting that I donated to the Ashland Public Library. So there are these wonderful connects. And um, this is the, uh, a church that I knew nothing about, but it's been involved with African American history and culture. And once again, it was the artwork that spoke to people, not who I am, but the artwork. And that's what matters to me, that the work connects with people all over. And um, it, I'm very proud of that. Um, and uh, embracing the spirit, women's perspectives on hopes, salvation and transformation. So 
I think this has been a, a joy. Uh, other artists look for or receive joy in different ways. Uh, uh, the big gallery, the big museum, where it sells and all of that. And I've had diverse joys from my artwork being public in many ways and connecting with people. It, you know, and that's, that's uh, been the main thing for me. So do you want to give a little context to what happened downstairs? Oh, um, Judy Howard um, has had the Hanson Howard Gallery for maybe five decades. And she would be the first one to show my work from China. When I had gone to China in 1976 and then developed a body of paintings, like it was where I had my first exhibit, not at the college, but often Judy. Judy was there for me. At the college, it was tougher. So that show is called China, an outsider's inside view. And it traveled across the country to about 14 different you know, colleges, university, art galleries, and so on. And then finally, I donated the work to the Coos Art Museum because I had a good storage facility and then more recently it comes to life again and the show that I had there which is my retrospective what how many decades later so it's just wonderful that the work you know has homes lives on and so the work from China is once again it's it's in here represented and um, and it has, it has a life that's that's that continues so that's you just you just have to be trusting um and hope that you trust the right people and that they care and will and then will make your work visible through time as appropriate for them too and their communities so there's no set time yeah um, I, let's see if there's a whole photograph of this. Oh, wait, I was going to show you this because I talked about the love totems. So here are the totems that you saw in the Schneider Art Museum. So those pieces downstairs were part of it. So this was recently at the Brower Art Museum where they have 20 of my paintings. And the person who made that connect for me was Lassa Nanada some time ago. And so on. So he's been a great friend through decades and so on. But it's the border crossings that have caught people. And it's also the fact that my folks crossed borders. They came from another continent here. I grew up with that heritage and that background. And um, just totally aware of the many holocausts that that the world has experienced, the injustices and so on. And right now it also connects very much with the migrants and the border crossings that they're experiencing from Latin America to the US, from Syria, um, crossing the Mediterranean and the horrors of what people, the, the shifts for many reasons, political, uh, climate change, uh, personal, that people are forced around the world to experience and um, connecting with that, connecting with that and social justice. So it's been a continuity, a long time continuity, but thank goodness there have been also experiences of peace and joy that I've been able to capture. And I'm very grateful that I've had this great family and a sense of community. And that's been beautiful. What will you do with your work? Um, How do you You've got, you know, we look below at, at storage racks and racks, and you've got... No, it's empty now because work is out. out. Um, what I've done is set up in my, uh, what do you call it, the, a trust, so that I have a deep connection, long-term connection with Willamette University and their Haley Ford Art Museum. It's a long story, so that what isn't already in public collections should be divided between them and this university and the money from any sales should go for an endowed art scholarships. So that's what I want. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but also here and there it's nice to sell which doesn't happen that often. And um, like, for example, the Brower Art Museum gave me three shows, but it's part of a university. And when I saw their new buildings with zero artwork in it, I donated 20 paintings. And it was such a joy to go back for my current exhibit there, this catalog, and to have faculty and students want to meet me because they come out of their classroom, they see these big paintings in their hallways, and they're just thrilled. 
So that's the kind of uh, what I like more than the personal home. And also the paintings are too big for 99% of personal homes. So, um, yeah, so I have work in a lot of public collections across the country. Um, and uh, that's uh, a certain gratification because you can't hold on to anything. It's all, you know, we're all moving. <laughs> we're all, There's yeah. a lot of collateral material that goes along with your work, though. There are photographs and your journals, your diaries. What the people who that? have my stuff is the archival collection is with uh, Willamette University, the, um, their library. So they have a ton of stuff and, um, and, and so on. So uh, I have more to keep giving them. Yeah, so it, it'll be there. And uh, so that's arranged. And here the uh, facility isn't so great for that. The, um, I mean, the Hannon Library, I mean, they already have permanent work in their permanent collection. Or the Schneider is really not that set up to collect more, but they will be receiving more and then for them to decide what they want. But as much as possible, I'm, uh, uh, like I just donated pieces um, to be up at Oregon State University. I have a good connection with them because that's where the husband worked or had that connect. He worked in the valley here, but he was paid by them. So um, they're art about agriculture. So I have uh, donated a lot. I'm going to have a show opening up in February at the governor's office in Salem of my bountiful harvest. And they were all excited about that. But um, so I'll be working on designating maybe more like certain more works should go to art about agriculture but actually donated two of those pieces to the biology department to honor frank lang so things you know so it, it um, i like doing that i um it's fine you know because uh, the work has to live on is is the feeling that i want and so on that's uh so I'm, I'm just going to get over this uh, thing here so I can keep on doing that. <laughs> yeah. So you've not had any problems with your hands? Um, yes, because in 1996 I had an etching press in the studio and I was using the rollers to roll colors on, like that big plate there. And I found it tough. Uh, the printing and the wiping and so on and I was also painting and painting is my first love so I yeah so I uh, decided to give up my etching press and to it's like after I started maybe in 1960 1960-ish I started at the you know college and then so it's it's been a good run of 36 years so it's like okay um, and now it translates uh, into those wood panels because the technique for cutting and shaping etching plates is what I'm doing with wood. And then the engraving, which is, um, I have a, um, tools that are, uh, you know, with a, a nut motor, yeah, the little electric motors. So it makes that gouging a lot easier. So somehow it seems satisfying right now to do these totem pieces uh, that are not as easy as the agricultural pieces which you catch like that, but these are more symbolic and so on. So right now it feels like that's, you know, what I want to keep doing for a while. I think it began with my sketchbook in the Bronx and in Harlem, because I went to the High School of Music and Art, which was in Harlem, and teachers, and then my connection with Charles White and Elizabeth Catlett. So the sketchbook became a catalyst for catching immediate impressions that then could be used as information to develop paintings. Um, and then the paintings began to happen slowly when I went to college in Cleveland and in Denver and Cleveland, but really began to grow and happen in a big way when I uh, had my scholarship to the Instituto Allende, Allende in San Miguel and then met Diego Rivera, met Siqueiros, met Tamayo, and saw the grandness of their work and the connection with community and history, and then uh, began to paint at the Instituto and have exhibits. So those were my first amazing 
amazing exhibits as a very young person, very serious about doing the work and respected by that country. Here I am, a young American, and and uh, given all you know, lots of opportunities to exhibit and so on, and then living with the indigenous people there. So coming back to New York afterwards was a period of uh, great turmoil for me, great turmoil um, and transition until I, I connected with Sun Bear, my Native American husband, and we moved to LA. And then I found the passion of etchings, and etchings could do my stories. Uh, it was a different form of storytelling, but also wonderful teachers at the university in literature that spurred my imagination that I loved literature in art, BC, AD, and just wonderful you know, teachers. So literature became a, uh, but also earlier in my own life, like it was Howard Fast um, um, and his book about the South, uh, I'm forgetting the name, and Mark Twain, Life on the Mississippi, uh, Maxine Gorky in terms of the mother, mother courage. Uh, so lots of books and poetry, uh, and then also African Americans. Um, and. Um, uh, Langston Hughes, for example, was one of the first authors I connected with. And then from um, Latin America was uh, Pablo Neruda and others. My, you know, my ability to recall quickly now is, is like there. So literature has always been a, a deep connect in terms of image making, but also growing up with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and growing up with the modern to where I knew Picasso's Guernica. So the richness of living in the city, having wonderful contacts as a young person, and then just building. So my first real body of work in terms of painting came with Peter and, and marriage here and the settling into a, a having a studio for the first time, uh, a studio, a really you know generous place to develop. So there's a lot of family paintings, a lot of Oregon joy and paintings about my children, um, and then um, and then uh, um, the sabbatical that got me to India, and a husband that encouraged. So I can't say enough about how lucky that can be because it isn't so for many women and um, so there was a body of work about India um, that trip so every time I had a cultural experience it began to be the um, the focus point for a, a body of work growing out of it and then connecting with um, exhibit touring services which was out of um, uh, Eugene at the Museum of Art there where they took my work and began to make shows for me that they toured and so you know so that I began to see you know and catch on to the process so when they folded I began to do it myself a grant to go to China like the first person in the valley here so I, I depended a lot on grants uh, 1976 when the doors just barely opened and you had to have special permission so I pushed but every time I pushed, I, I was obliged to make the work count for other people. It wasn't just me having fun in the studio. It was just also, how does that work? How do I, as an individual, reach out? So I had to learn to do slide talks and talk to any group that would hear me and be very open. So I got used to that and didn't mind because the talking and the questions that came reinforced ideas and concerns and, and helped me. So everything I did sort of I felt very lucky. It was like a full circle, and it just kept spiraling. But um, the real big breakthrough in terms of writing was the commitment to go to Latin America. I forgot how many years I went to, about 11 countries only. But that was the stories of these women in my first you know, book um, that I wrote about other women artists. And the consciousness of the women's movement was, to me, very limited here because Judy Chicago, and I also brought women onto the campus. I brought Judy Chicago here. I brought uh, Faith Ringgold here. Um, and um, all the, uh, uh, several of the authors of major books. So those days there were enough funds and so on. But also the f work of the feminist movement to a large extent was body-centered. And a lot of it was sexual. And, um, and for me it meant much more much, much more as I traveled and saw women struggle and the stories they had to tell through their artwork. So I just 
was part of it and ignored it and grew in my own way and contributed through women of color, which they weren't touching, but women of color around the world. And then in this country, when I did Women Artists Multicultural Visions, it was African Americans, uh, Native Americans, and uh, Hispanic. And I went to their homes, their studios, and documented and so on. So all that was like, just exciting and everything gave me back so everything was reciprocal if I gave to somebody I got it back and it inspired my own work so that was also it you just don't take but you get and you give but it gave them visibility so that when I taught my classes I had the books I had the material and I could share and make it alive and interesting for them any idea how many discrete pieces of art you've created oh uh, through etchings and uh, several hundred paintings and oh yeah I worked with Heifer International I didn't even talk about that and uh, they paid for m almost all my travel and it's all donated to them in public spaces they have an education building with 26 of wood panels up there and then in their major building they have about 30 paintings yeah it, it's it feels so good I mean that kind of thing and there wasn't a money exchange it was I mean I it was in the sense of the travel. What an education, you know. How so many pieces. Oh, I don't know. Uh, oh, for heifer, uh, about over all, sixty, overall. several hundred. Oh, and etchings, uh, maybe <coughs> two hundred etchings. Uh, yeah, and paintings, and then wood panels. And I got into wood panels, a lot. Uh, yeah. Do you have a checklist of your work? Have you photographed every piece of your work? Uh, uh, sort of sporadically, and then it's given away or it goes away. And uh, I do have a sort of inventory as to what's left, sort of, because more recently I gave away more paintings, more wood panels, and because um, they will eventually be divided between, you know, Willamette and SOU and um, endowed art scholarships is the goal. So it's that's kind of the the you know what it's about i i don't exactly have a tight inventory i keep it's hard for me to keep up with me because i don't have computer skills or secretarial skills up with me a little bit. Yeah. Tell me about them. And um, these are my social justice uh, panels. And um, they go from the darker dreamers to still we rise to uh, climate. This is climate. These are the tornadoes, uh, the cyclones from Alabama to Mozambique. And um, this is close by. This is Paradise Lost, the town of Paradise and the fires that we've just had, the devastating fires that we're seeing once again in Australia and other places. So dealing with the issues of here and now. And this is one about build bridges, not walls. Yeah, so anyway, um, this is my anger at Melania Trump when she went to the border to see the children about a year ago. And she wore the jacket that said, I really don't care, do you? So this is my piece called The Children. I really care, do you? And this is a piece about the shootings, the school shootings, and the children who were walking with signs saying, am I next? And that was even here in Bedford, Oregon. So, um, that's, so I've been concerned with all these issues of here and now, and these are some of the samples. Uh, to um, Arizona. I was invited by Peg Bowden, 
who lived in the valley for like 30 years and she's a retired nurse and uh, Arizona was her homeland. But she wrote a book called A Land of Hard Edges that dealt with the migrants who are trying to come from Mexico into the U.S. and dying on the des on the, in the desert in Arizona and so on and how she uh, connected with Samaritans, uh, mostly older retired people who said, no, this is wrong. And they would do things like um, leave water uh, bottles out in desert areas where migrants you know, were known to pass and so on. But it's a long story and um, what happens too is there are many supportive groups and it was an amazing experience to learn that these are good, mostly white, comfortable Americans who cared about what was happening. and. Um, also, they would go on desert searches for migrants, but when they found areas where they had died, with nothing but bones left, um, they would mark that area, make a note of it, and then go back and actually put a cross, plant a cross. So this is the planting of crosses. It's a desert cross to honor that person, to honor the DNA, to honor the life, and have a ceremony, hoping that the spirit of that person would reach the family and know that they were being honored in some way, even though their journey, their hopes and dreams had not reached fulfillment. Uh, so it's actually, um, yeah, so this is the last piece I just recently finished prior to, you know, to having to deal with my own leg issue. Um, and it's Enrique's Journey, the book by Sonia Nazario that inspired this piece. And it's about a child, a child, Enrique, who tried to reach his mother of the United States. So from Honduras, he tried several times and finally made it, but he had to take La Bestia, the trains, and the horror of that, and so on. And Sonia, as a reporter and as a writer, she also experienced that. She made it part of her learning and writing experience. So in reading this book, there was also a chapter called Hungry for Hope. And that's the, that feeling, those words, inspire this particular piece. I had a gooder looking one, but that's a part of the collection at uh, Willamette University, or Cobo. One a great harvest, and um, Oscar uh, um, works with uh, Michael Moore, but um, this is his daughter, and, uh, and so on. So these are two of the panels that have traveled around the country a fair amount with my uh, Celebrating Life exhibit. This goes back to um, the water protectors and um, what was happening with pipelines and uh, water, uh, love of wa water, not oil, and uh, water is life, and um, also the horror of what was happening and the, and, um, the people protesting, you know, not, not wanting the pipelines to come through. These are symbolic, but also um, inspired by what's here now in the valley. For example, I chose a totem form. I did not go to, to Standing Rock, but I chose this totem form um, as a way of connecting people, eyes, people who came from around the world to protest what was happening, but also because I so love Russell Beebe, our local sculptor, Native American, and his totem, We Are Here, um, that's been on the plaza and now in our library, Hannon Library. So that became symbolic. So this work is a bit more difficult to, to connect with because it is um, symbolic. And that's, and that's the difference. Johnson, my neighbor from across the street for 44 years. Um, so I would, um, I would uh, paint with a brush the image that I wanted him to cut. And then he would cut, and then we would go back and forth, and then he would route for the different depths. But now I've been doing it myself. 
Uh, so I'm handling it differently. So I start with plywood and I disappoint people in the lumber yard because I like the roughest and the most beat up boards because I love the texture of the wood. And I like to emphasize it. And I'm very capable of cutting and shaping it with my little skill saw. And then I don't do the routing. I'm afraid of that tool. So I use my wood carving tools and I cut out and layer the wood. So that's kind of the difference. Well, when Peter and I married in 65, 1965, um, we built a very, we were, our, we could only build a very simple, simple house and um, with a choice, a big studio or a big kitchen, so it's obvious. And then for a long time, because the kitchen's on the other wall of the studio, Peter would accuse me of cooking with a smoke alarm. Um, after China and India, I stayed in that region a while. I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't doing global hopping, but I went to Bali, to Java, to Sumatra. Um, I went to Borneo, which was fantastic, and Papua New Guinea. So those were the areas after India that I went to. And then came Latin America, and then came Africa, because I found the African influence in Latin America, especially in uh, Nicaragua and love the, what was happening with Nicaragua, the political art, the artists, the mural painting, just loved it. And, um, and built friendships there uh, with, with other artists and um, so on. So, then, after, so then, then I began to go to Africa and actually my African-American woman artists sent me there. They said, you know, you go. Um, but also going to professional meetings um, where there were um, faculty from other countries at the, uh, what is, what, what was that, uh, through the uh, Art College Art Association and through the National Art Education Association. And they said, you come and we'll make sure you meet women artists and so on. So that was my first foray into Africa. I was a dean, a man uh, from the University of Benin in Nigeria, and he did and to, and indeed, and I just loved what I was seeing and learning, and so on. So, you know, it's just been, um, uh, you know, just exciting uh, to have all these, you know, experiences, and, but to give these artists visibility. And very often, too, I would be invited, I got grants from the U.S. government, oh, I forgot the, the uh, uh, cultural, aspect to teach there, to do little workshops. And then Eritrea, I got stuck on Eritrea, including during peace and then during war. So I was going to camps, camps for dislocated people, seeing what war does to people, seeing the tragedy, but also seeing how they used their artists, how their artists documented the war. And these were the women artists I documented and feel so proud of, Eritrean artists in War and Peace, and then the specific women, um, and so on. And then eventually to donate all the paintings I did about Eritrea back to Eritrea and to being wel welcomed by the government. Uh, and so on. So, um, yeah, so that was a big, uh, I think, 26 paintings they received from me, but they brought me back. They wanted to show me how they would be exhibited and how they would move around the country uh, to their different universities and then have a public, you know, a, a public home uh, and so on. So what, what could be better? You know, just, just uh, like that. And, um, yeah, so I feel... I feel pleased that I've been able to do these things. Mm -hmm.